Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and we've got a treat today. Wolfie6020 and I are going to talk airplanes and aviation. Now we started this part of the series last week with Blue Marble Science, who is a flight instructor. Wolfie6020 is an international commercial pilot and is just a wealth of information on everything related to aviation. So let's cue up the music and have a chat with Wolfie6020. Are there any things that are special with flight that you'd like to talk about? Because we've got a lot of expertise on you. For example, if you're flying north-south, mm -hmm. do you have to take into account Coriolis? Well, I think a lot of these flat earthers don't ever do the math on just how insignificant that is. If you if you do the if you do and I, I use an example in many of my responses to flat earthers, and that was from uh, Bali down to Perth, because that's almost due south, and it is about three hours duration. So you can calculate very accurately the changing uh, angular, angular speed or linear speed at Bali compared to Perth. And you have to adjust the aircraft speed to match that as we're flying over a three hour period and, and it equates to about the same as a one mile per hour crosswind. That is easily compensated for by the aircraft. And Very what are actual point. crosswinds at the altitudes you fly that you deal with just from normal weather? Yeah, yeah it, it can vary um, typically 40, 50, 60 knots. You know, if you're flying across a jet stream, um, I have videos where we're flying across 120 knots of crosswind and the aeroplane is compensating for that just fine and it's remaining within one wingspan of the course even with a 120 knot crosswind so when we're talking about the effect of Coriolis being less than one mile per hour equivalent crosswind it's just insignificant it's so small that it's barely even worth worrying about. Now, another thing that I think is a very common misconception about people that don't actually know how airplanes fly, mm -hmm. and there are some very smart people out there that really just don't. It's, I don't know how scuba tanks work. You know, sure. I've never had any experience with them. Sure. But, well, when you fly an aircraft, it's different than flying either a hot air balloon or riding an artillery shell, right? It's under control. Absolutely, it's, yeah. Now, the other thing is, when you set your inertial reference system, your navigation, mm -hmm. you don't set it on a straight, flat, laser-like course that you kind of just fire and forget. Your correct. course is actually set over the ground, isn't it? That's correct, yes. Yeah, basically, I mean, the, the, the course is between uh, waypoints. Um, and each waypoint has a very specific uh, coordinate, latitude and longitude, and that is obviously over the ground. And the tracks between each waypoint are precise tracks across the ground. That's what the aircraft is flying. Okay, so it's not flying straight independent of the earth and the atmosphere and just, that's why, that's one reason, for example, that you wouldn't have to drop altitude because you're not flying a straight line. You're flying a set altitude above the ground. Yeah, it's three-dimensional. You're flying a set altitude above the ground and you're flying a lateral course, a lateral path. So the, the navigation system is constantly computing your current position, comparing it to the precise route between each waypoint on your flight plan. And if there's any slight deviation, the heading of the aircraft will change slightly left or right just to put the aircraft back on track. And this is occurring constantly and because it won't allow the aircraft to deviate off that track, the corrections are so small, they're just fractions of a degree. So you're, you're basically not even seeing any of the, the angle of bank changes just to remain on course. Now, going back to your flight from Bali to Perth, yes, you said that was about three hours. Your aircraft goes 550, 600 miles an hour, roughly, or not, yes. I should say. Let's give you on a good day, you're doing 10 degrees an hour. Mm -hmm. And if it's a three hour flight, Bali is about 30 degrees, say, north of Perth. Is mm -hmm. that roughly right? Roughly right, yeah. I'd have to look at it again, but yeah, that's close enough. 
Basically, you've got to transverse that 30 degrees and your Coriolis will be based on the rotational speed at Bali and the rotational speed, the linear speed at Perth, Correct. right? Correct. And the difference between those two... About 190 miles per hour because I remember that specific example being three hours, 180 minutes. It was it was working out quite close to an average of one mile per hour. That's what I wanted to get to. Yeah. The bottom line is a lot of people say, well, if you go to the leave at the poles and then you go to the equator, you've got to suddenly gain 1,038 miles an hour linear speed. Mm -hmm. Great. But you don't do it instantaneously. No. That's over 12 or 14 hours. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, it's and done you have to. Aggressively. Yeah. And you don't change your speed in increments of an hour. You don't even change your speed to address that linear speed in increments of a minute. You do it Correct. continuously. Absolutely. So yeah. even if you break it down to the minute, much less the second, yes. it's almost indistinguishable. It's a it mile is. an hour. It's, it's less than a mile per hour on average. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing is, um, I, I have seen that argument and I've seen Brian Mullen's argument, his video on that. I actually sent him a very long email explaining it and he ended up closing his channel a short time after that. So I never got a response. But um, yeah, exactly right. And remember, the aeroplane is constantly tracking a ground track. It's, it's maintaining a ground track. So if it detects that it is deviating from that ground track, it will make a heading correction. And that is that is how it's correcting for crosswind and also the Coriolis quite easily. That makes a lot of sense. It's constantly tracking the ground track and keeping you on it. It's not even anything you consciously deal with. No. I've exactly. never dealt with Coriolis and I've made yeah. some long flights. I took yeah. a Mooney from California all the way out to Michigan. My oh, wife yeah. and I did. It was a nice little trip. That would be wonderful. Didn't, didn't account for Coriolis. <laughs> but but but, uh, but you did account for track, didn't you? Yes, you I did. To stay on track. By, by doing that, you were um, correcting for Coriolis in the process. Because exactly. You were didn't even have to whatever. think about it. Exactly. It's like when you're driving a car on the road and you have a strong crosswind. You know, I mean, a, a car is attached to the ground, but a very strong crosswind can blow a car to the side. But... When you're driving your car, you're not really thinking about the wind. You're just looking at the lane and you're making corrections to remain in the lane. And by doing that, you're compensating for the wind. You're compensating for any steering misalignment in the car or any camber on the road. And you're not even thinking about it. You're just making small adjustments to remain in your lane. Flying an aeroplane is exactly the same. We're making whatever is whatever adjustments are necessary to remain on course. And also in a vertical sense, making vertical adjustments as necessary to remain at the desired altitude. Well, you don't get much leeway, do you? No, you, you get don't. a wingspan, especially with a professional pilot, you get a wingspan. I get a little bit more because I'm an amateur. Yeah, we, we, get, uh, we get plus or minus 100 feet on the altitude, on the, uh, the lateral tolerance. Well, it, it's all changed a lot now. Everything's just becoming more and more accurate with uh, performance-based navigation and um, if you're flying across the North Atlantic tracks between America and Europe, they have just extremely precise navigation requirements um, because they've got a lot of aircraft, or prior to the COVID-19 virus, they had lots of aircraft getting across there every day. But yeah, yeah, you don't get a lot of leeway and you, you certainly have to maintain accurate lateral tracks and also vertical altitude. Okay. Now, you did a couple of very interesting videos the other day you were talking about gps approaches yes. mandating curvature of the earth yes now when you fly just in general flight do you fly a curve or do you just fly over the ground i fly to maintain an altitude and if i'm trying to maintain forty-five thousand feet i will do whatever is required to maintain forty-five thousand feet and that means if the aircraft deviates either up or down we make a correction to the nose attitude to regain the desired altitude that is that is an ongoing thing again yeah but when you're bebopping along flying through the air you just maintain your altitude and course 
Yes. The curvature of the Earth is specifically accounted for on approaches because you're very near the ground. Correct. Nobody yes. ever got hurt by running into air. You Correct. do get hurt by running into terrain. Correct. So they want to make sure that you are very precise on these approaches. Yes. Exactly. And they have to take the curvature of the Earth into account with that. Exactly, yes. How accurate are those approaches? Well, I can fly from Sydney, Australia, and I can be I can take off in literally zero zero visibility. I can fly four thousand plus miles to Hawaii, and I can fly an instrument approach and break visual at two hundred feet above the ground, and I will be precisely aligned with the runway and at an exact three degree approach angle. And I can do that without any reference to anything on the ground, purely based on. Uh, GPS positioning inside the aircraft and the fact that we know exactly the size and shape of the Earth, the WGS-84 dimensions matching with the GPS precision tells us exactly where we are at all times. So that GPS will bring you in on an approach within mm -hmm. 200 feet of the ground? It'll take you right down to the runway and you will impact the runway precisely at the touchdown point if you just follow the uh, instrument indications that the 200 feet is the legal requirement where we must be able to see the ground to continue the approach. That's for, um, for a, say, for example, for an ILS approach. But uh, with the head-up display, we get an extra 100 feet on that. So, for example, if we're flying um, an instrument approach into Hawaii and the cloud is at 100 feet, without the head-up display, we would reach 200 feet we would say not visual and we would have to go around. We would have to execute a missed approach. With the head-up display, when we get to 200 feet, as long as we can see the runway lights through the enhanced vision system, that the co-pilot may not be able to see anything, but the captain flying through the head-up display can see the instrument approach lights. I've got a nice video I might uh, send you a link to later on that, but. Um, we can continue down to 100 feet above the ground. And at that point, we then need to be able to both see the actual runway lights, at which point we can continue the landing all the way. But having said that, if it was an emergency, and uh, I did touch on my emergency landing in Shemya up in the Aleutian Islands, we had zero, basically zero visibility, and we were able to just fly that instrument approach continually all the way down to the ground. And we literally just saw the ground a few feet before impacting it, just enough time to produce a slight flare and land. So yeah, the, the 200 feet, the 100 feet, that's just a legal requirement that you need to be visual before you can continue and land. But the precision of the instrument approaches will take you straight down to the runway. So in an emergency, they're going to get you there. It's amazing, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, it really is. Well, do you have anything else you want to talk about with airplanes? Not really. Um, no, I think that's covered it. I've got a couple of videos on following the curvature of the Earth. Happy well, I guess that's two quick things. Um, if the Earth is rotating, there would be a linear rotational speed at the surface. Mm -hmm. The rotational speed in the atmosphere 50 miles above the surface is only about 20 miles an hour faster. So it really doesn't make a difference, does it? No, not at all. And then you've got to factor in all the local winds as well. Okay. So generally, the other things that are going on in the atmosphere, specifically weather, jet streams, things like that, are far greater than any effects that rotation would occur. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I think you actually did a video once to show that the distance across the Earth and the distance across that same path at 30,000 feet Mm -hmm. is less than a mile difference over most trips, wouldn't it be? It's less than 1%, yeah. It's it's very small. And if you just take the radius of the Earth, uh, 6371 kilometres, and then you compare that to, say, 14 kilometres of altitude, that 14 kilometres is a very small percentage of the 6371, and that's essentially what the extra distance equates to, the same ratio. You know, folks, that was a great interview. I really enjoy talking with Wolfie 6020 because I learn something every time I talk with him. I hope you guys picked up a few things as well. Now, next week, we're going to actually talk to Charlie H. 
Now, Charlie is an interesting guy because he literally worked for a year in Antarctica. And I think that some of his experiences from Antarctica may give us some insight into some of the questions that Flat Earth likes to raise. Here's somebody that's actually been there personally. So hit that little bell icon, hit the like and subscribe button. And remember, we have memberships and a Patreon. And if you can help the channel out, that's great. If you're a member of the channel, you get to work a little behind the scenes with me in the production of some of these videos. Maybe we'll end up even doing a collaboration together. So, in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much, and I'll see you again soon. Take care, guys.